Good evening and welcome. I am Dr. Tiffany Cresswell Yeager, Assistant Professor of Higher Education Leadership. Each year, the School of Arts and Sciences at Gwynedd Mercy University offers Campus Conversations, a series of lectures, presentations, and panel discussions focused on a theme that is relevant, timely, and connected to our mission, core values, and the critical concerns of our sponsors, the Sisters of Mercy. The goal is to create and encourage dialogue on those topics as part of our commitment to intellectual inquiry and lifelong learning, and to highlight the expertise of our faculty and other scholars in disciplines related to the theme. This year's theme is systemic racism. Tonight's presentation, Teach Your Children Well, Racism in Education, is the fifth event of our five-part series for this year. In other sessions, we explored topics such as an examination of protests and looting, racism in artificial intelligence, structural racism, civil rights and equality, and building an anti-racist police force. For more information on any of the other events in this series, please see the news and events page of our website. If you are participating live this evening, please enter questions and comments via the chat function, and we will address as many as possible during Q&A. This evening, I am pleased to welcome our panelists. Our first panelist, Dr. Derek Coleman, is the superintendent of River Rouge School District that borders Detroit, Michigan. Our second panelist is Dr. Angela Campbell, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Germantown Friends School in Philadelphia, and also an adjunct faculty member at GMRCU. Our third panelist is Dr. Shonda Goward, Director of the, Cent the Student Center for Academic Achievement at California State University, East Bay. And our fourth and final panelist is Dr. Ronald Whitaker, Professor of Education and Co-Director of the Center for Urban Education at Cabrini University. Thank you for all, thank you all for being with us tonight. So we're going to get started. I'm going to ask our panelists to start by sharing a background of what has originated them or, or involved them in your work in social justice. And I'm going to ask Ron if you'll start. Well, first and foremost, uh, it is an honor to be here in this critically uh, important conversation, uh, one that I'm so happy uh, that we are grappling with tonight. Uh, you know, in many ways, and, and I know that I could share it within this space, uh, I, I believe that my work within the realm of uh, social justice, how it intersects with equity and also going deep with issues related to race and racism, it's a calling, right? Uh, and I believe that I want to put a, a Old Testament uh, spinoff on my work. I, I believe if we're really going to deal with social justice, uh, we have to be like the Old Testament prophets where we have to be truth tellers, right? And we have to not be afraid to, to speak truth and to talk about the conditions within society. Uh, quite frankly, you know, my work, you know, whether that's in uh, K-12 spaces, in higher educational spaces, or even within organizations, uh, also challenge individuals to think deeper about issues related to social justice. Because quite frankly, I believe that too often uh, we reduce social justice to the soup of the day, right? So everyone is talking about social justice, but you know, I, I, I haven't found too many people that are able to define it and then show ways that they are operationalizing social justice. So all that to say is that if we're going to be deep, uh, go deeper uh, with issues related to social justice, race, racism, I, I just challenge us that we're not just looking at it from a surface level perspective, but from a deeper level perspective. And I think that that's uh, the, the core of my work. Excellent, thank you. So I'll, I'll introduce the next truth teller here tonight. Uh, Shonda, would you share a little bit about your background and how you've come to, to the social justice work? Sure, and I echo uh, Ron, if I may, Ron's um, sentiment about being here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm so honored to be with these fellow folks. Um, I have no choice but to be committed to social justice because of how I grew up. Um, my grandparents uh, on, came to California in the 1940s looking for a better life out of the South. Um, I come from a very working class city. 
that I now reside in again. Um, my mom was a single parent during the 1980s. I'm from the West Coast and I'm a Gen Xer where uh, we were afraid, you know, crack, um, the, the, the horrible economy of the 1980s, gang violence influenced my experience. Um, I had to move out of California, my family did, um, because we couldn't afford to be here. So gentrification, it started, uh, we think about the tech boom, but it had already started in California in the earlier 90s. Um, and my high school's graduation rate was 35%. Um, so many of my classmates are deceased or incarcerated. Um, and then, so I finally made it out. I went to college and I had a horrible experience at one of the top universities in the nation. And so for me, social justice is a no brainer because my family members are still impacted by so many of the awful economic and, uh, and educational policies that uh, have been in enacted since I was a child. And then I watch students um, go through these same things that I went through as a college student so many years ago. So for me, it's um, it's a requirement because of the where I come from and who I am. Thank you, excellent. Uh, Derek Coleman, Dr. Coleman, can I ask you to respond next to how you've come to, to your work in social justice? Uh, yes, thank you, Tiffany. Um, as Ron and Shonda had just spoken about their journeys, uh, I was drafted into this movement. I'm a child of Detroit, uh, the city of Detroit, a uh, child of the early 70s. And so my experience mirrors that of any young black male born into a home with a mother who did not complete high school. The socioeconomic conditions of the community uh, made it virtually impossible for us to escape. They often talk about crabs in a barrel and how they describe the black community as crabs in a barrel, that people aren't allowed to get out because they're constantly pulled back in. But it's not the natural habitat for a crab to be in a barrel. So when you place people into poverty, generational poverty, that is systemic, it is virtually impossible for them to escape because there is not a clear path out. And so um, I've spent the last nine years as the superintendent of the River Rouge School District, where our free and reduced lunch rate is 97%. Prior to that, I spent four years as an assistant superintendent in Detroit public schools. I worked in multiple urban districts in the metropolitan Detroit area, but I am literally someone who suffers from survivor's guilt. Uh, as a gifted and talented student that did not have the confidence that I should have because of the socioeconomic you know, environment that I was in, um, I didn't start college till I was 20 because I had not seen anyone who had gone before. And and so once I made it out, I carried this incredible guilt that I had to then return to help, you know, show people another way out. And so as we talk about education uh, and social equity in, in America, I think that the, the racism that is embedded in our educational system serves as a hindrance to young people. Because again, they're trapped in environments where like crabs, it's an unnatural environment for humans. And yet they're in there and they have no way or mechanism to escape it because there is no clear path. Thank you, Derek. Angela, would you share a little bit about how you've come to this work? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. I come to this work around social justice, um, thinking about the immense love and support that I received from my parents. We were working class and were the first generation to enter the middle class when I got into high school. And I was given a lot of support and opportunities. And the experience of love and, and just faith in me and what I could be. And to grow up in such a supportive environment, I believe social justice is giving others the capacity to give that love and support to others. And so I've dedicated myself to support educators and community members to know what that love is, what it feels like, and the power of it to transform self and society and community and schools. The last thing I'll say is that social justice for me is ensuring that people have what they need to be their best and most whole selves. That um, we think about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs 
and I think about systems and policies and practices that enable all children, regardless of background, to be able to have what they need to reach their highest potential, to be uh, the best that they can be and to fulfill their purpose here on the earth. Thank you. And you know, just for our audience to think about, that was just the introduction. So we're gonna have a really great conversation here this evening. We're gonna start out with some questions and please feel free to add uh, Q&A in the chat. We'll, we will make sure we, we look to those questions and, and try to provide answers to you. At this point, I'm going to address a question to a panelist, but any panelist can jump in and we hope to have a really powerful conversation around this topic. So our first question uh, for tonight is, what is an educational practice or policy that has historically led to systemic racism or institutional discrimination unbeknownst to the larger society? And I'm gonna uh, ask Shonda to start this one. Uh, it's challenging because so many things happen to, to people, because I work with students of all ages, um, before they become into the higher educational space, right? So we have, um, at my current campus, many of our students are limited income. Um, they are first generation students. Some of them have vast life experience. Some of them have children and they've had so many damaging experiences already, whether it be in the educational system or in the justice system or just living, right? But those are the ones we know. What they don't know is when they get to campus, and this is just in higher ed in general, is that many of their folks they interact with may be racist, um, that our hiring practices are often classist and very racist. Um, in my current system, in the California State University system, we serve a majority of Black, Brown, and Asian students, and yet our faculty are overwhelmingly white. Um, we have a we just got our first leader of color ever, um, as did the UC system. And so those systems that put things in place where those people who make budgets, structures, classroom decisions, um, is one of those things that people aren't aware of. Another one is in financial aid. Um, financial aid isn't as set as people think it is. We have programs in higher ed like merit aid. Merit aid often awards people who are vastly privileged. It's a recruiting tool to bring students who may go, for example, to an Ivy League institution to your institution instead, um, instead of putting those dollars to students that need them, right? And so people aren't aware that they, they often think that it's a federal thing, and it is a federal program, but we know um, that, school, that inst individual institutions administer it. We think about things like academic um, probation and academic recovery, um, which students get extensions, which students get counseling versus being put out of school for a semester or so. So all of these hidden policies um, that get set by folks that don't come from the same backgrounds on the students, don't look like the students, um, are those things that are unknown to the public. And so we preach the education of gospel of go to college, your life will be better. And that's if you make it, if you get through it. And oftentimes the onus is put on the student and never the institution to do better. Derek, do you wanna comment? Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Shonda. Uh, and, and if I may just be frank, uh, our K-12 curriculums are not inclusive of uh, real history or, or, or valid information. And so they say that history is told by the victors. And if you look at the way in which our history is told or represented, it, represented there is very little uh, detail or accounts of the African-American experience, that of the Native Americans or any non-Anglo-Saxon uh, vantage point. And so young people are literally educated in a system that does not acknowledge any of their, uh, their talents their accomplishments, their skills. And so you are led to believe early on that you or your, 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 your people have had very little value because those contributions are simply not included. Or they are, for lack of a better phrase, whitewashed. And they're told in a way that is very uh, pleasant to the reader, but it's not honest. And so how can we have justice or social equity without justice? And justice requires that we're honest about the conditions of those people, how they ended up in these centers of uh, poverty, the oppression that they were uh, reduced to, 
And the last thing that I want to say is that as, as an African-American male, I've always felt that we have been devalued by the public. And if you think of the African experience in America, we were needed for our, our brain power and our labor, but not wanted by a country. And then once slavery concluded, whether it be Jim Crow, segregation or other laws, our educational policies all are centered around our, our experience and we are not included. And therefore it is virtually impossible for us to receive an education that provides equity. And you can't have social justice without equity. Real quick, quickly, uh, Dr. Creswell Yeager, if you don't mind, if I could kind of do a follow up to Dr. Coleman's point. And Absolutely. I believe, you know, as he was talking, I got to thinking about one of the most important books that every educator should read. And it was published 1933 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And the title is The Miseducation of the Negro. In uh, this book that I just referenced, Here's a quote that Dr. Carter said in 1933. As another has well said, to handicap a student by teaching him that his bl black face is a curse and that his struggle to change his condition is hopeless is the worst sort of lynching. So as Dr. Coleman was talking about our curriculum, I think we really have to grapple with the fact that in many ways we are putting band-aids on an educational system that was never constructed for the majority of students, right? Uh, so we have to really name that so that we can frame that. Now, as I tie in that particular claim with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, but also in, in, in regards to, in, in reference to your question, I think we also have to grapple with Brown versus the Board of Education, right? Now, obviously, I'm not uh, you know, demonizing those that were on the front lines, but I think we also have to grapple with what happened to black educators and black teachers after Brown versus the Board of Education, right? So we know that yes, uh, whether it was lack of resources or quote unquote inferior schools, but we can't overlook the spirit and the culture in those particular schools when we had black educators, black teachers, when we had those individuals living in communities, there, there, it, there is research and there's data that will suggest that in those schools from a test score perspective, right? In many ways, they were outperforming not just pure schools, but schools across the country. Why? Because you had individuals with PhDs that were teaching in those schools and that lived in those communities. So I think we also have to look at the fact at the Brown versus the Board of Education, those black teachers, those black educational leaders, they weren't given the same opportunities, quote unquote, uh, I'll use the Ratner School District, which is near Cabrini University. I'll use Upper Marion, which is near Cabrini University. I will use Lower Marion, right? Uh, so now here's what, we're, here's what we're dealing with in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm working with the Pennsylvania Department of Education on an initiative called Aspire to Educate. Why is that initiative important? Because we know that 92% is the percentage, uh, is the national percentage of teachers across the United States. In PA, that number is higher than the national percentage. We're at 96%. So if we don't understand the historical backdrop to why we got here, then we will make a lot of um, will make a lot of claims that has no substance. We'll think African-American, Native American, Latinx, they just don't want to teach. And we overlook the historical backdrop and the policies which disenfranchise these individuals that were on the front lines from actually being included into certain spaces. Incredible, yeah, great, excellent points. Uh, Angela, did you want to add, I saw your video come on. I want to make sure you have a chance to, to comment as well. Well, absolutely. Well, Dr. Whitaker took the words out of my mouth. I wanted to make the point um, that Vanessa Siddle Walker and James Anderson um, um, wrote about um, the plight of Black teachers after integration. But the other point that I think is also important to mention is the actual purpose of schooling, the actual purpose of education is one that reproduces and reinforces, unfortunately, the systemic inequities that we are talking about tonight and that um, too many children are suffering in today. 
And so the purpose of schooling, the purpose of education um, shifted from more of a humanistic, and I would say not so much shifted, um, it was designed, essentially the common schools were designed to give the majority of people a basic education that excluded indigenous people, people of African descent, people of color, and created a system to create workers so that people would have just enough training to be able to work in a factory on a, on a farm or, you know, and today to be able to be either a low wage worker or middle manager, um, but not to think in terms of human flourishing, to think in terms of the purpose of education to inspire us being our, our better selves, to think about designing a world in which all of us could be free, could be to could experience equity and inclusion in a world that is co-created by all of us and not just a few. So I think that um, thinking about the design and the purpose of education certainly reinforced uh, the injustices that were just talked about. Thank you. Um, there's a, a comment in the chat related to something Dr. Goward said about gentrification. And I just wanted to put it out there. The, the person asked if someone could explain a little bit about it, what it is. They've heard it many times, but they don't really know what it means. Um, does anyone feel comfortable sharing a little bit about what gentrification is? I guess I'll hop on since I mentioned it. Um, so I'm Thank from you. the East Bay, which is right outside of Oakland, California. And I lived in Washington, DC for a long time. So I've seen it happen, It the thing, gentrification happen really quickly and really, um, yeah, just really quickly. And it really is a displacement, and I know Dr. Coleman's got something to say because I know he's seen it. Uh, <laughs> right. It's the displacement of, of peoples from a space that they've been in and it's often um, accelerated by the political climate. So in Washington, DC, um, one of the former mayors invited all these developers in to the city um, and to take on land that was uh, being used by city residents um, and, and to the point where now property values have pushed out many native Washington DC folks. Um, that happened, I think in, the, in five years, I watched that occur. In Oakland, it's a little bit slower, but it's still happening. There are empty condos everywhere in Oakland right now. And as you, if you follow the Moms for Housing movement over the summer, there we have a, a significant unhoused population here um, in the Bay Area. And so it's it encompasses many things, but especially the displacement of people who are from that space, out of that space, using a variety of mechanisms, whether it be economic, or political, um, starving systems of funds to support people not providing a safety net in that city um, and using often nefarious means um, of levers of particularly government is what I'm thinking about, especially what I watched in Washington, DC. Yep, yep. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Excellent point, Shonda. And it's almost a reverse migration. And so uh, in the 60s in Detroit, there was extreme turmoil that was founded on racial tension. And the 67 riots saw many uh, white families leave the city of Detroit and move to the suburbs. The city in itself began to struggle or suffer as a result of the lack of economic activity. And those communities had multi-generations or generations of families that had called it home, those neighborhoods. And when it was decided that these areas were now prime real estate, those families were then again forced out, displaced, and to people who heard about it, it sounded like, oh, well, they, they get an opportunity to leave, but that was still their community, their culture, their family. And consequently, you find people who feel as if they're literally without a land or without a nation because that was all that they knew. And it's all done in the spirit of capitalism. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Shonda. Uh, these are important background pieces of information for the context of our conversation tonight. So thank you for sharing that. So I want to, to move to our next question, and, and that is, how is racism enabled in education and how does it affect student success? And I'm going to ask Angela to start out and then I'd like Shonda to um, comment as well, given her professional experiences. Sure, I mean, that's a great question because if you think about policies from tracking to um, 
you know, the hidden curriculum where a lot of the knowledges that people need to be successful in schools is actually not made available, not made explicit, but those who have it are rewarded. And so if we think about um, how schooling as opposed to education redirects our thinking and our resources to reward and then to punish those that don't fit the mold, don't have access to either language, to a particular vocabulary or to a set of skills or even the track, a pathway to gaining the skills, then there's a reproduction again of inequities through curricular tracking or through other practices that are not made explicit but are rewarding and punishing students and families that know how to conform to those behaviors that are rewarded in schools and then punishing or leaving out those students and families that don't either know the system, don't know how to advocate and navigate those systems. I think those just are a few ways that that occurs. Thank you. Dr. Goward, would, would you like to respond based on your experiences as well? Absolutely. And so what um, Angela's talking about then feeds into if you happen to be able to gain some kind of access, well, first, before you get access to higher education, um, there was some research done in 2012, and I wish I could call the, the citation where in California, um, we already don't have affirmative action, which is actually on the ballot this year. So I'm really intrigued to see what's going to happen with that. We're one of the eight states that doesn't. Um, and what they find is that every time the state tries to find ways to change admissions policies, particularly to the competitive UC system to be more equitable, um, white families uh, challenge those um, attempts to be more equitable. Or if they find that they are in the mi minority, so what you're seeing at many UC system institutions is that Asian students are outperforming everyone. And so they are garnering more spaces because we don't have affirmative action here. So then uh, what you now see are white families saying, well, wait, we shouldn't just look at test scores and grades. We should look at leadership as well, because again, that would um, then center them. So every time there are changes um, around attempts to be more equitable, um, what you see is a, a backlash against those in a recentering of wealthy white families. Um, and then if it's, even if it's a policy that's supposedly supposed to benefit them when it doesn't, when another group does well, then again, we see a recentering of wealthy white families. Um, and so that's the first hindrance in my, my space in higher education is getting in the door in the first place. Um, I work at a broad access institution, so we're a regional institution, so um, uh, we're not as broad access as a community college, but we, we accept many of our applicants. And what happens as far as student success is one, there's in broad access institutions or just in general, is there's an apathy around students who don't perform well, and it's often blamed on them. So there's two words we have in higher ed, there's retention and persistence. Retention refers to what is the institution doing? What are they responsible for as far as getting students to not just graduate, but also learn? And then there's persistence. What is the student responsible for? What are they doing? We often focus so much on persistence, 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 and we never look at what um, Dr. Campbell's talking about, which are the institutional structures that are preventing persistence in the first place. So um, thinking through, do you have um, like Dr. Coleman talked about, a curriculum that actually reflects your student body or the world that we live in today. Have you hired well so that your, your staff and faculty are diverse? Are your systems so labyrinthine that no one understands them? Are your, uh, so I'm an administrator versus faculty member, and oftentimes you have that one administrator in one office who does so much for students and then um, if you can't get a hold of that one person, then that then all these other students are backlogged, right? Or they, that person leaves because they're overworked. Um, and so you have all these labyrinthine systems that don't allow students to persist. On the retention side, um, people don't look at the numbers or there's excuses for the numbers, right? Why is it okay when an institution's graduation rate is below 50% in, in the excuses, well, we're a broad access institution. Okay, but your job is still to educate those students. So what are you doing? Where are your dollars going? Um, one of the reasons why I chose to be an administrator versus a faculty member is because 
there are very few people of color and particularly black folks in rooms where budgets are decided. And I get to be in those rooms and I get to say, hey, these dollars are all going here and why are they not coming over here? What can we do about that? And so um, those are some of the things that, that hinder student success is really institutional accountability is not a thing. Accrediting bodies don't look at that, right? Um, or if they do, you know, incremental progress is acceptable. Um, and we need real leadership that's going to say, you know what, this may be acceptable to some, but it's not acceptable to me. And we're going to do better as an institution, as a system. Thank you, Dr. Goward. That was, I, I, I feel so inspired by every single person. I wanna clap and I wanna cheer every time each of you speaks. Dr. Coleman, do you have something you wanna to add to that? Yes, I'll be very brief though. It, it, it's the irony in our educational system. Uh, intellectual capacity and academia are determined by how successful we are in this K-18 or K-20 uh, system, <clears throat> excuse me. But the reality of it is education was never designed for the masses. And yet you'll take children from communities where vocational training is desperately needed because there's great honor in being an electrician, a master plumber, uh, a carpenter, a barber, or whatever vocational track would be possible for families due to environmental issues. There may be learning deficits, uh, lack of access to someone outside of the community who can show them a different path. And so we move, we view while they talk nationally about career and college education, the focus is really on college. And I think that it is a death sentence for some because debt is the new slavery. And we're sending the kid, we're sending kids to college because nationally it's been told that this is where they need to matriculate. When the reality is we need to make sure that they can become mechanics, plumbers, electricians, and whatnot. And they're able to walk away with no debt, ultimately become skilled tradesmen and make the same money that lawyers, uh, doctors may make, but they're they're shunned for choosing that route because there's pressure on us to make everybody college ready when the reality is that college is not for everyone. My district pushes what's the best path for that child because we have a responsibility to provide them access and opportunity that they would not have otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Uh, there is a question in the, um, in the chat related to suggestions for resources. And uh, Dr. Whitaker, I know that you work in anti-deficit frameworks and I just wanna throw this question to you. Uh, my high school is currently starting the process of going through our curriculum to be more racially equitable. Do you have any suggested resources to do this in particularly in science where I'm personally working, what I'm personally working on? Yeah, so I, I, I think that that's a very important uh, question, right? Uh, but then one also that we have to look at from a broad perspective. Uh, before I go strictly to interventions, whether that's within disciplines, I think I also need to challenge us to give the historical backdrop, right? Uh, again, so a lot of my work is interdisciplinary. Uh, and I also look at it from a historical standpoint. So I think we have to go back to studying Du Bois, where Du Bois would talk about in his influential book, The Souls of Black Folk, that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Now we're at the 21st century, and guess what? It's still the problem of the color line. And if we don't get it right uh, within these next 80 years, once we get to the 22nd century, it's still gonna be the problem of the color line. So I think we need to look at it from a historical backdrop. I think we also need to look at uh, some other texts that are, are, are really pushing us to go deeper and think more broadly on issues related to race and racism, Cornell West, race matters. But here's another uh, book that I think is very important. And this is uh, a book called Democracy in Black uh, by Dr. Eddie Glaude, who is a professor at Princeton University. Now what Dr. Glaude does is that he helps us with the framing. Uh, he says, you know, oftentimes we're talking a whole lot about the so-called academic achievement gap, we're talking about employment gaps, we're talking about healthcare gaps. But here's what he does is he frames, um, he coins a term that he names the value gap. And he argues that opportunity gaps, academic achievement gaps, healthcare gaps, employment gaps, is all a result of the value gap, the ways in which 
we value white bodies in comparison to others, right? And he talks about in his new book that the value gap is sustained by the lie, right? This lie that we have continued uh, to tell each other within America that, you know, if you just work hard and if you just show grit, you can have opportunity. So the point is this, uh, we have to look at a historical backdrop in, you know, in, in regards to issues of race, but then we have to also look at how that's tied into uh, institutional inequities. Now, uh, within educational spaces, after, you know, we're, we're, we're grappling with the historical, then I would argue uh, that there's some things that can help us within our practice, right? Uh, so whether that is, how do we have the conversation, right? So Dr. Howard Stevenson, he would argue that many of us are, are, are racially illiterate in terms of the language that we're using. Uh, so we have to develop those skills. Uh, what he argues is that uh, to have the conversation to us, uh, you know, for many of us, it, it causes a lot of anxiety. It causes a whole lot of fear. It, it causes other emotions that gets in the way with us having the conversation. So he talks about the need for us to become racially literate. I think, uh, you know, a, a other works that we can really grapple with, Dr. Milner, when he talks about, uh, you know, start where you are, but don't stay there. So he's really talking about opportunity gaps and issues of race within the curriculum. Obviously, if we want to look at it uh, from a cultural standpoint, so whether that's culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally sustaining pedagogy, reality pedagogy, I would argue you have to read the books of uh, Geneva Gay, Gloria Latson Billings, uh, Dr. Paris, uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Emden. Uh, so those are some spaces. Uh, but then uh, even if we're going to talk about equity, and I believe that this is uh, the um, uh, related to the question, uh, let's also make sure that we're committed to equity and not equality, because many of us are saying that we're committed to equity, but at best, we're doing equality uh, practices that recapitulate uh, inequities within our spaces. So I would also argue that uh, Dr. Paul Gorski, his work on equity is something that could push uh, the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Any any other panelists would, would like to uh, add any resources that uh, they would like to share? Yes, um, in addition to that, and those are outstanding resources, um, going back to the history, as Dr. Whitaker said, is essential. Um, a text that it's very comprehensive, but um, Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, and also, looking at resources from what Tara Yasso says is a community cultural wealth perspective, which is an anti-deficit model perspective of seeing resources, yes, in books and in videos and text, but also seeing the resources in the stories and the perspectives of the people that we are serving, the families of the students in our schools and gleaning and culling from their stories and their narratives insights into need, aspiration, innovation, and also calling from them um, new ways and new pathways for education and for new possibilities in society. Um, one clear example of that is if you look at the Freedom School Movement, and if you look at in Philadelphia, um, the only charter school that is a freedom school links the purpose of education to applying the purpose of education to everything that a person learns is designed to improve conditions. And it starts with understanding one's own conditions, the strengths and the, and the possibilities that exist in the home and in the communities, but also being critical around systems of inequity that ex exacerbate conditions of inequality in those communities. And so I think it's a both and in terms of research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from panelists before we move to our next question? Okay. Um, so this question is, what is the most pressing challenge? And I, I think we've talked a lot about the challenges that, that we're facing in education, but in your opinion, what is the most pressing challenge to ending racism? Um, I'm gonna throw this one to Dr. Goward to begin. Hey, I, oh, I, this one, I was going to assume that you were going to go to Dr. Campbell. Um, 
I don't know. Um, I honestly can't say. I, I know that it starts with, well, actually that's not true. One of the things, it would go back to K through 12 education and the way it's funded. And you can't have quality schools when you're basing it on a tax base. We know that. Um, we would want, in, in the state of California, we are especially challenged because we're, we have such a, we have a challenge with our budgets because of our prop, Proposition 13 that limits um, taxes on housing here. So we have issues there. Um, so that's one thing. In, in higher ed, it, I think it starts before it gets to us. We can't change our system until some of the social things that are happening in communities that Dr. Campbell's talking about um, are worked on. And then there's a demand from those communities to push it into higher education. One of the things we know is that there is no poor person's lobby, right? So every other group has a lobbying group. There's no one that goes on to the Hill and says, we are a group of people who are lobbying on behalf of the working class and the poor. And that's because they don't have time, right? My family members don't have time um, to figure out how to work together uh, to lobby Congress or to lobby their local government to change laws that work for them because they're working two and three jobs or they're ill or they're in disability and all those things that make life as a working class or limited income person harder. Um, and so advocacy in those areas, and it's it's challenging because as someone who grew up poor and is now, I guess, uncomfortably middle-class, I can't speak for that community anymore, right? How do I how do, I do that work um, or at least support that work? That's challenging. Um, there are, as uh, Dr. Coleman said, there's not many of us who made it out. And so, um, oftentimes we don't talk about what he talks about the survivor's guilt and how painful that can be um, as you're trying to do it all and you just can't. So two things, one is how things are funded. Um, they will continue to be racist as long as they're funded in the way that they're, they're done. And it has to start with the basics of human life. So housing, food, um, everything else. If we're not fair in those things, then we're absolutely never going to be equitable in education. Excellent. Thank you. Dear, Dr. Coleman? Yeah, and, and I'm just as comfortable with dear Tiffany. So um, I just want to say that I don't believe that fundamentally it is possible because racism is literally woven into the fabric, the fabric of America. Um, the reality of it is Dr. Claude Anderson talks about in Poweronomics that the black, black people as a whole do not have a power base. They do not have an economic base, and therefore they are excluded from those greater discussions. Neither political party has done anything to advance the position of Black people in America. And I don't want to make this just about Black because uh, Native Americans have literally been the victims of genocide and reduced to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, reservations. But the reality of it is in order for us to have equity, someone has to be willing to give up something. And I'm not against capitalism. I'm not against people having the opportunity to be upwardly mobile, but there's enough, there are no, Jeff Bezos uh, could literally end world poverty tomorrow and still be ranked within the top 10 on the, uh, the world's richest people's list. That's just not how America is, 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 taught, is that's not how America thinks. We thought that we, we, we've been led to believe that our thought process drives us to get as much as you can. And you're not thinking about the other people. Some people would call it natural selection, that those that are able to achieve should because they've made the right decisions. They don't understand how a group of people from their inception into this country have been disenfranchised. And so I don't believe that, rate, that it is possible to eliminate racism because it is an institution and institutions cannot be changed. They can be destroyed. Who's willing to sacrifice? The sacrifice that it will require is far greater than a collective is willing to make. And therefore we'll continue to have these discussions, but I'm a firm believer that you can't end racism. You're not gonna end poverty because poverty creates an economy. We spend in the state of Michigan about $52,000 per prisoner, but only provide $8,200 per pupil for education. And our prison system is privatized. Poverty creates an economy. And so I just don't believe that it is possible because the global elite 
or our nation's elite have no desire to redo the infrastructure or the institution as it is because it benefits too many. Thank you, Derek. And, uh, Angela? Well, thank you for that, Dr. Coleman. Just wanted to um, remind us of a, a quote by Brian Stevenson, who is the author of Just Mercy, um, alluding to the problem of mass incarceration. But he said, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, but justice. And so I do believe that um, whether or not we can eliminate all of the systems we can do our part. We're doing it right now. We are speaking into reality new possibilities for human relationships and how that can be threaded into the purpose of education and that that can be reflected in the history and the resources in terms of books, in terms of pipelines and pathways for higher ed. And I would also say that it's also possible that we can infuse and inspire people to care more about one another and to use our gifts and to use our talents to, cre to create more space and more opportunities for more people. And that doesn't mean necessarily the elimination of, of, of racism, but it does mean that we can start where we are, imagine where we want to be as we've been doing, as we, as we are doing now and should continue to do starting with the educators on the call and saying, wherever you are, bloom where you are planted. Focus on the vision of equity, inclusion and belonging for the students in your care, in your school, in your neighborhood, in your family and do the best that you can there. So uh, I wanna agree with, um, with both uh, Dr. Coleman and uh, Dr. Campbell, uh, but I would also like to add on and really suggest that uh, if we're going to be committed to ending racism and dismantling, as Dr. Coleman kind of argued, uh, these systems of oppression uh, that are predatory, uh, then self-care is also critically important. Uh, for those of us on the front lines and, and whether you know, you're know you in higher education or K-12 space, I would also like to argue uh, that this work will uh, be extremely draining. And at times you may feel as though you're the only one uh, that's really pushing the conversation in the ways uh, that you know, the discourse needs to go. Uh, meaning that you know, I, I believe that too often uh, we jump in the pool, but everyone wants to stay in three feet. But if we're really going to be uh, committed to dismantling these systems of oppression, we have to go to the deep end. And once you decide to go to the deep end, you could become a threat, right? Uh, so I want to give a historical, again, I always have to give historical backdrop, you know, uh, take it back to Dr. King. Everyone loves Dr. King in, on uh, October the 28th, 2020, but in 1967, Dr. King was not a popular man. He wasn't popular in white America. He was not popular in black America because he was causing the nation to look at the inequities from a broad perspective, right? Uh, this, this vicious war in Vietnam, right? Why are we sending people over there to Vietnam when we're dealing with mess in the United States of America? We're sending people overseas but yet when they come back home, there's no opportunities, right? Let's look at uh, the, the, the uh, level of poverty, right? Not just in Chicago, but also in rural North Carolina. Let's look at the level of poverty in North Dakota. The nation has to do something about this. So once he started to become a truth teller and to push the conversation a little bit deeper, that's what Dr. Coleman was talking about in terms of dismantling these systems of, of uh, that, that prey on, uh, on vulnerable individuals and communities, once he started to, to, to point the shotgun that way, he became a threat because he's dealing with the power structure, right? What I would like to argue is that we have to now in this moment, this moment of uh, Walter Wallace and, and this moment of Breonna Taylor, this moment of George Floyd, this moment when we're still not healed from Sandra Bland and, and, and from Trayvon. This moment, what I'm arguing is that we have to not 
uh, uh, progress past the peace pole moment where we gather and we light a candle and we sing a song and we hold hands and someone cries to now getting to the point culturally responsive pedagogy where we're opening in, opening up opportunities so individuals can have paper, meaning money, right? So that we can have access to various professions, right? Uh, we, we have to understand that the surface level notions of equity, that's, that's done with, right? We have to deal with these systems that continue to prey on vulnerable individuals and vulnerable communities. And if we're ever going to get there, that means individuals have to give up power, right? And that also means that uh, individuals that have been targeted, they're saying, mm -mm, we're going to fight this power structure. And if you commit it to that level of work, believe me, it's going to take a lot of support because there could be death. And I'm not talking about metaphorically, I'm talking about literally. When you stand on the, on the front lines of that type of movement, you become a threat. Thank you, Ron. Really very powerful words. Um, any, I, I wanna just make sure that anyone, um, any panelists that wants to comment, uh, so that we come full circle on that conversation, uh, really, really, uh, Dr. Whitaker really challenges us to, to dig deep and uh, to, to be aware of what the work looks like on the front lines. The next question um, is specific to a, a program um, and Dr. Goward mentioned affirmative action is on the ballot. The question is, how does affirmative action impact our view of racism in education? And I'd like to look at this both from the negative and positive. So I'm gonna throw it out there to any of our panelists um, who would like to begin. I guess I can start, you know, I think about uh, when I was in college at LaSalle University, um, I wrote an article on affirmative action that got published and um, at that time in the 90s, okay, we look at the historical evolution of affirmative action, it started with providing um, opportunities for mostly women and white women, I would say, benefited the most, as we know now, from affirmative action policies. But those policies were designed to recognize the historical disadvantages that were built into systems, um, employment practices, and so forth, and to, re, to correct, to redress the harm that had been done by, um, in an affirmative way, uh, looking for the most qualified candidates, whether it's to enter a graduate program, to enter an undergraduate program, or to get a job in a particular field. And I think that what happened with affirmative action um, when we moved from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s and you saw the political uh, backlash, um, conservative backlash um, to dismantle affirmative action policies, um, the, the discourse shifted from race-based policies uh, and reverse racism, um, these two ideas became linked, unfortunately, and you started to see a dismantling of affirmative action. But affirmative action is essentially, um, th these are programs and initiatives and policies to right wrongs, right? To provide opportunities for uh, populations, people of color, women, uh, who did not, who were not given opportunities in the past because of those identities. Um, and unfortunately, it, there's been a battle around that as, um, more conservative policies and, and people in decision-making positions decided that we're equal now, everyone has an equal chance to make it, we don't need affirmative action and nothing could be further from the truth, especially um, for black and brown communities, BIPOC communities. Dr. Goward, can I ask you to share a little bit about what's on the ballot? Uh, if there's a historical context or a, a specific preposition or proposition? In California? Yes, it's Proposition 16. So um, this all praises go to Assembly Member Shirley Weber um, out of Southern California, who finally decided to say, you know what, uh, Proposition 209 has been in existence for decades, and there, there have been attempts to move through the system to repeal it. Uh, Washington State has done so, um, although there were some challenges there after that happened. Um, why can't we do this in quote unquote liberal California? 
And so um, the original proposition really started from someone outside California, Ward Connerly, who really wanted to um, move this across the nation. And it, it wasn't even just the, we're all equal now, it was just, I don't believe in affirmative action. So 16 is on the ballot. Um, propositions here are complicated. Um, our, my ballot was five pages long, front to back. So you've got all of your political candidates and all these other things um, in propositions. And the, so the state will vote whether or not we're going to repeal Proposition 209 this year. Uh, it's not looking good right now. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, the, the UC system in particular is as far as, well, 209 impacts all state entities, right? State and local entities. But in, in my area, the UC system is particularly impacted by um, the ban on affirmative action because all these things that everyone is talking about build up to students not having the same opportunities to have the same um, measures in testing and such forth to for uh, entrance at the UC. Now, what COVID has made plain is that we don't necessarily need testing, right? Because all these schools have suspended it. So I, it will be interesting to see how universities justify going back to testing with SATs, GREs after COVID's over, if you were able to admit a qualified class without it. So um, for example, at the University of California, Berkeley, my neighbor, um, they have what, 20,000 undergraduates and less than 600 of them are black. You can count them. Yeah, I saw you blink. Less than 600 of them are black. Now, that's all of them. Take out the athletes. Right. So it's it's dire in the state. It's a it's it's beyond an equity issue. This this is actively classist and racist combined um, in our state. So we, we're hopeful that um, 16 passes. This time there is an active coalition of um, uh, by POC, so Black, Indigenous, people of color. There's a heavy um, uh, contingent of Asian folks who have jumped in to say we are Asian and we support affirmative action because there is a group of uh, Asian American folks who are suing institutions, um, claiming that they are being left out of those institutions um, because of Black and Brown people. And we know it's more so other things like legacy admits and things like that. So there's a, there's a coalition around it and we're hopeful that 209 finally gets repealed. Wow, well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Coleman, Derek, do you have comments? Yeah. Yeah, just quickly. And you know, the this, this sad tragedy uh, about this is that it, it's desperately needed. At no point in time in the history of uh, minorities and especially people of color in this country has the access been equal. And so affirmative action was created because it was recognized that there was uh, exclusionary practices that were embedded in its overall structure. And yet we cannot speak to a time where black people or other minorities have been provided equity. And yet in the state of Michigan, they have uh, disallowed affirmative action. Affirmative action just gives people an opportunity that would not be granted to them because that space uh, is not inclusive of people who aren't homogenous to it. And so I just think that the tragedy in it is that, again, at no point in time in the history of America has it not been necessary, yet people who are able to make the decisions have decided that we're gonna to continue to keep it off the ballot. And it just further creates uh, or adds to the wealth gap. Thank you, Derek. Um, it is eight o'clock now, and we want to have ample opportunity for Q&A. So I'm going to ask anyone to add questions to the chat. I am going to check that now. And um, as you're thinking of your question, we'll continue through our planned questions, but we will stop to offer um, any that you may have. Uh, so I want to start with a, a question that Nancy posed in the chat function, and that is, I've seen recent movements in communities in Pittsburgh where parents and students are demanding change, greater equity, greater representation. Do you think these changes in education can start with the consumers of education? I'm gonna throw that to our panelists. Hey, sorry. I'm sorry. Go, go, Dr. Coleman. 
No, thank you, Dr. Whitaker. I was just saying, I think that I had an issue with my internet because it froze and so I couldn't hear the question. Let me reread the question. So um, the, 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 the participant is asking about recent movements in communities like Pittsburgh, where parents and students are demanding greater equity and greater representation. And her question is, do you think these changes in education start with the consumers of education? So will, will things change because of the students and parents calls for representation and equity? Yes, uh, well, let me just say there, I, I would argue that that's a good thing, right? In terms of uh, whether students, parents, community members, really uh, letting it be known that these inequitable practices uh, can no longer continue. I think we're at, a, uh, at a, a moment in time where we realize this can no longer be top down, uh, but those individuals that have been historically marginalized, whether we're talking about students or communities, they need to be on the forefront and they need to challenge, again, these power structures. Uh, going back to in improvement inquiry, uh, which is a uh, very important methodology within educational spaces, and one uh, that I would argue if we're really talking about frameworks that educational leaders should, cons uh, should uh, consider. Uh, but the central tenet is this, every system is perfectly designed to deliver the results it produces. Let me say that again. Every system is perfectly designed to deliver the results it produces. So therefore, I believe students are saying, no longer can you dupe us. Parents and community members are saying, this has happened too long. So yes, they need to be on the forefront. And, and how about this? Educational leaders, whether that's principal superintendents, if we're really talking about equity and, and, and uh, formulating these long-term plans, it, it's, it's good to have teachers at the table, but most importantly, you need student voice, you need community voice, and you need the voices of parents and guardians. And I would just respond, uh, excellent points, Dr. Whitaker. Mm -hmm. I would just like to add that I believe it, it, it solely depends on the social and political capital of those parents. Because the, the, the group that has the, the most power or capital within a, very, uh, a region or a community will determine how policy is shaped. And so if those parents don't have an, a loud enough voice or a large enough share, they'll go and their answers may be left unheard just simply because they don't have enough equity not to overplay the word or capital in order to make a difference. Excellent point, Derek. Other panelists, anything you'd like to add? We'll move, we have another question in the uh, Q&A. That's what I, what Derek was talking about is exactly what I was gonna say. Without capital, no, you, and, and there's a, you have to, find ways to push and and the great thing is that we're in an era of social media so there's ways to call out folks um i would encourage that parent to uh, listen to the podcast nice white parents um and it explains how inter integration happened in this one particular school in brooklyn and how all of these quote unquote nice white parents had all of these things to say about this particular school and never sent their own children there. So they shaped the policies for that 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 school for what 30, 40 years, even though they never sent their own kids there because they had money and they had the ear of the school board in the city. Um, and so, yeah, it really depends on the capital of that particular group of parents and students and how they use it. And fortunately, there are ways to build capital now that, that weren't available to those black and brown parents and low income parents um, of the of the integration time that you all have now and I encourage you to use them and um, and especially right now when we're on zoom i've been watching my city council meetings at home in my house. Um, I can respond I can get I can ask questions on zoom in a way that many busy parents may not have had a chance to to do before and have to go down to city hall and demand that they keep continue this. Even when we go back in person, there needs to be some kind of virtual environment so that families can contribute to all of these conversations. So um, it is challenging without capital. I think the, the 21st century techno technological world we live in now allows you to build capital in a unique way. Um, and so as long as the parents are partnering with their young people who can help them think through that, I think absolutely. And I would just add very briefly to that question because it's really good and, and all of um, my colleagues on the call answered it very well. 
I would also say that um, if you think about what Dr. Goward said about the social capital that's linked to social media, if you look at the Black at movement that happened in our summer of racial awakening and racial reckoning, that you saw schools respond to parents and families, but also to alumni and to concerned citizens who wanted to see a difference in schools. And so um, it, when the, the person that asked the question said, does it start with the consumer? Um, I agree with what Dr. Coleman and Dr. Whitaker and Dr. Goward said that yes and no, um, it certainly should include the consumer. And I think the consumer from a grassroots level should be the thrust of change. Um, but some other players need to be involved for that capital and or there's a savviness or sophistication in the way that families organize to address the system and kind of, I hate to say hit them where it hurts, but the point is to identify the areas of inequity in a strategic way. The Black Act movement, letters that are calling out the racism in the schools for, uh, for a lot of schools, especially in the independent school movement. Uh, we were talking about that, Dr. Creswell Yeager, that it made people make some serious changes in policies and practices, and I can definitely attest to that. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Um, I, I want to sort of segue into one of our questions because Dr. Campbell just hit on some of the, the things in terms of racial awakening this summer. But I want to pose to the panelists, um, what's the greatest change or the most recent shift that you've seen in anti-racist work in our society? Um, what do you think is, is the, the, the biggest shift that, that you've noticed? So I'll just start just to kind of continue from what I was saying before. I would say from this summer, the horrific killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, uh, George Floyd um, in the most recent one um, in Philadelphia, um, it set into motion a reawakening of activism that was strategic and that was happening in different places uh, and spaces. And so you had it happening in, in the streets, but you also had it happening in social media. So when I referred to the Black App movement and I referred to um, people posting their positions and calling situations out and policies that aren't fair and people writing petitions and letters and organizing with alumni, especially in higher ed. When you see multi-generations of alumni coming together to put pressure on an institution to make change, that's where um, school leaders then have to reckon with it and have to make new commitments. And what you saw this summer, what you saw in the private sectors and in independent schools, um, in higher ed and in independent schools, you saw the need to react and to respond with urgency to make commitments around anti-racism. And then if you're in a position like mine as Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, that those cannot be hollow words if you're committed to the work. As Dr. Whitaker said, one has to go deeper and has to go deep inside the policies and practices that reproduce the systems of inequity, exclusion, and lack of belonging and valuing the students that are in our institutions. And so the pressure from the consumer can definitely make a difference. I'm gonna ask real quickly, Dr. Campbell, if you could stay on with this, cause I wanna uh, play off of you, you know, where uh, good friends and colleagues. Um, but if we think about what's different and I appreciate Dr. Campbell, that you're talking about this summer, but then let's also be truth about why this summer, right? Why? I, I take us back to 1955, August the 28th, 1955, Emmett Till is murdered, right? Emmett Till's mother decides we have to do an open casting. I don't have time for the story because we can no longer hide what racism and violence looks like. The nation needs to see this. If we go back to the summer, and I'm gonna focus on George Floyd, not to overlook anyone else, but we gotta ask ourselves, why would George Floyd? Eight minutes, 46 Eight, seconds. 846. 846. Mm -hmm. No longer could we assume that he beat the cops up, right? Or no longer could we assume that he did something else. Why, why is that important? Uh, because Sandra Bland, you know, that they're framing it with, she was aggressive because of mental health challenges, right? Mike Brown, the cop said that he was a hawk and he was 
afraid for his life. Brianna Taylor, they, they, the narrative was her house was a trap house, meaning a drug house, right? Uh, Trayvon, Trayvon, he was aggressive and he was out uh, to, to you make a drink that is called lean, right? Uh, you, we could go on and on. Eric Gardner, he was selling Lucy's. Eight minutes, 46 seconds, we seen a man crying for his mother. We seen a man that was not violent. We seen a man urinate on himself. We see um, the nation, the world saw a man that was saying, I can't breathe. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. No longer could those in America that wanted to demonize certain individuals, they could no longer say, this is bad. Now, I'm going to look at it from both sides. I believe that it's, it's, it's exciting now that we're having these conversations and individuals are, are being challenged to go deeper. Another piece, if we're gonna look at the good, is that uh, if we look at this summer, who's on the front lines of these movements, right? Uh, millennials, and, and we know uh, Gen Z, they're on the front lines. Uh, we know that even those individuals in the most conservative spaces are now saying, we need to have the conversation, but I caution us that I'm hoping that this is true equity and not embarrassment. It's a difference. And oftentimes when we look at why does diversity plans fail in diversity initiatives, because it starts with the moment where everyone is embarrassed and we want it to go away. So we put all of our resources around ending this embarrassment. Let's get a plan together. Let's put a statement out and let's assure our constituents that this is no longer going to happen. Right. And then after the diversity plan, that's yep. where it stays. Yep. There's no, opera, you know, we don't operationalize the plan. And those individuals that have always been marginalized, guess what? After a book talk, after some sort of a webinar, after some sort of an expert, it's back to business as usual. So let's look at eight minutes and 46 seconds and the potential that it has to, to change the nation but then let's also not overlook one of the things that I'm afraid about, that this is nothing more than embarrassment. And this is embarrassment that the nation wants to go away. Yeah. Well, I would just say, just in response to that, because everything you said, I completely agree with. I do think embarrassment is at play and that it is part of, of the everyone posting Black Lives Matter, we're anti-racist, we're about change. I'll also add that once it happens, and once those declarations are made, people then have to stand behind them and persist and not sit down and not allow it to go into the shadows. And I do think that's the test for those of us in, in these kinds of positions. The test will be when we're in a new season, will there be a rolling back of the gains that have been made this summer. And so it will take tremendous vigilance and persistence and tenacity to make sure um, that, that we keep the fire on it, that we keep it going. Uh, and that's also the challenge. So I, I honor your statement, I appreciate it. Tiffany, and if I may, uh, I think Dr. Whitaker made an incredible uh, point earlier that a system produces what it is designed to. And I don't believe that there's been any shift I think that there has been a greater polarization. I believe that it has pulled the veil off of uh, hidden or institutional racism because just as loud as the Black Lives Matter movement has been and this moment, there's the group to the right, which has been equally as loud that have stormed the state capitals in uh, Michigan and in Pennsylvania. Uh, they've marched, they've become even more aggressive. And so what we have seen in the history of Black America is protest and rebellion. You will see a riot is a voice of, the, uh, of an oppressed people. So we become upset, we protest, we march. We may uh, damage some storefronts, but there's been no fundamental change. So when I think of a shift, I think of something that creates a mechanism that allows for change. And I believe that it's only raised the vibrations on both sides, we're more polarized while it appears that we've galvanized, I believe that we're more polarized because people aren't standing in the middle. They're either on one side or the other. And that, that, that group is equally as loud on both sides, but I believe one is far more aggressive and for lack of a better word, ruthless 
and what they're willing to do to see things remain the same. Thank you, Derek. Dr. Goward? Tiffany, I would just, so your original question is what have I seen change? And I would say nothing, not in, not in higher education, not a thing. I've seen some DEI officers hired uh, or at least the positions put out there. I don't know if they were actually hired. They're not at the level of the cabinet where they should be. Um, sometimes they're coming from corporate. They're not coming from those who have a higher ed administration or faculty background. Um, who have an interest in education. And it goes back to what Ron is talking about as far as, is this just a Band-Aid to make it sound good or are we actually going to do the work? None of the metrics have changed, right? I haven't seen any announcements saying, due to all of this, we're going to look at our, our admissions practices or um, our financial practices. Um, instead, what changed admissions practices was COVID, not the protests. So no, I haven't seen a thing change. Um, now, what it does do, what these protests do do, and it, it's fantastic, it gives people in my space this, the chance to say, oh, but you put a statement out, what is the actual change? And then when we're ret retaliated against, we can say, okay, but this is what you said you were committed to. I can point to a thing, right? You said we were going to do X, so let's actually do X. And so it gives me more room to keep pushing. And those who, who are the like um, similar mindset to keep pushing because as an institution or as a profession, because it's not just the institutions, it's our professions as well, right? Our professional organizations all put up their black square and their Black Lives Matter and they still have it up. And where is the support now for people who have been laid off, people who have been furloughed? Um, it's not there. So I can keep fussing and say, you can't do X without Y. Right, this, this algebra equation is not quite, um, or as they say in the country, that dog don't hunt. Yeah, thank you, true, very, very true. Uh, there are some comments in the q and I wanna make sure we get to those or questions. Uh, Victoria Sherlock has shared with us, uh, this has been discussed on the documentary, The Uncomfortable Truth that's on Netflix. And she, she goes on to say, it makes her sad, especially uh, because she has a young daughter who's multiracial as well as herself. How can multiracial people who still identified as black get through this? I'm gonna throw that to the panelists who would like to go first. I'm just gonna step out there. Um, I really respect and appreciate the question um, about those who are multiracial. Um, and I would say this is about humanity. This is about the human spirit. Race is a social construct. Race is, is, has been made up to create um, systems of, of exploitation and oppression. And so I just um, encourage people who see themselves as multiracial um, and for all of us to, to situate ourselves in a deep rooted understanding of what it means to be human. Um, and to celebrate the differences of where our ancestors came from and the experiences that we've been talking about all evening, but to say that who we are as human beings is at stake right now. Who do we want to be as participants in a system that wasn't created for our hum human flourishing and human dignity to be sustained? And so I think that it's, it's staying close to one's core and one's center um, if one is a person of faith, to understand the role of spirit in um, transforming reality for oneself and for one's family, even in the midst of the chaos, you can find a center of peace, possibility, and purpose. And so I just encourage that, that reshifting to not, not allow the external to define the internal, but to allow the internal, the core of oneself, to define who one is and who one can be in the world. Derek, if uh, you'd like to comment. Yeah, I would, because it's it's funny. It's one of the first questions that I've ever encountered that I don't have a definitive answer for. I can tell you how I feel uh, as, a, as a black male who has a history either being developed, nurtured, and working in impoverished communities and how I feel the, 
the game should be played for people who, you know, have been in that space. But I've never thought about what creates room for, you know, uh, someone who is of mixed race. I can tell you that I have brothers and sisters, while they're not biological, we share a kinship who are of mixed race. And there were times that they felt like the black community didn't fully embrace them. And they didn't feel like they connected, you know, with the white community. And so here they were just in this space trying to figure out where did they fit. And I just think that I would, you know, uh, urge you to figure out what it is that you're seeking to accomplish, find like-minded people, and then make that a reality because the path is going to be hard, you know, either way, but I would just tell you, choose your heart. And th their space there, it's funny, we're, as a people, we're all much more alike than we are different, yet society will classify you by those differences. And there's a group, uh, there's a community, there's a space where you'll be able to flourish and find comfort in. I just don't know exactly where that is based off of where you are. So just seek truth, stay on that path, and, and energy begets energy. It, energy, it can't be destroyed nor created. It can only be transferred. So find it, pull it to you, and those things that you wanna see happen will. Thank you. Uh, another question in the chat uh, comes from Haley Guillaume, and sh she asks, how can white people be better allies and elevate the voices and concerns of the BIPOC community? And if you, anyone wants to speak to the concept of allies, activists, um, accomplices, so what advice do you have for Haley? Go ahead, Derek. You're, you're unmuted, so I'm going <laughs> to throw it to you. Um, I, don't, I don't think any movement has been successful without having allies. I think our greatest uh, failure has been to ignite the voice of those who feel that oppression has been uh, a constant in America and they feel bad for what's happening, but they're not active. And so I would encourage you to identify others who have a, a greater base and join that, that movement, that fight against uh, injustice, because the only way that it's going to happen successfully and we can create change is to have more people who think that way take action. And oftentimes we, we have plenty of discussion, but there are enough groups, there are enough local movements that can create enough you know, energy or vibrations that can then impact uh, a region, which could then impact a city, a state, and then the country, but it will not happen without having allies who are willing to commit to that movement and understand that in order for something great to happen, it requires sacrifice. No, that's wonderful. I would just also add, you know, an, an ally and accomplice, um, Walter Fluker, who wrote Ethical Leadership, he talked about an accomplice means that you're willing to put your backside on the line, um, meaning that you're willing to put yourself in the way of oppression to protect the dignity of a person who is a member of a BIPOC community. Um, and I get this question a lot in my role. And so um, for those who are white and, and are allies and want to be accomplices, I think it's important um, to remember that your humanity is tied up with mine. It's tied up with those that you seek to help. How do you use your, your racial privilege or your gender privilege or any other form of privilege to help those that don't have it? It's important to really deeply listen to them, to, to make sure that you don't unintentionally um, bring the privilege back in the space, right? Um, and that can happen unintentionally by thinking one is doing, one is helping another when one actually is taking up the airspace. Um, but to fall back in no one's role in helping members of disadvantaged communities, but to also know that they have power and strength and voice and can represent themselves as well. Thank you, Angela. 
Uh, Jen Mellon posed a, a question in Q&A that I'm gonna read for the panelists to uh, uh, have a, a chance to comment. I have seen some information on integration being a positive to improve outcomes for students, both people of color and white. Do you agree with this? And do you believe there is a chance of integrating schools again? Panelists, do you have any comments? Shonda? <laughs> uh, so black folks who sought integration weren't necessarily looking to be schooled next to white students. What they were asking for was really the same resources that white schools have. This is what Ron was talking about earlier when he talked about the consequences of uh, Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, and what happened to black and brown teachers. We had excellent teachers and we had good schools. We just didn't have the same resources as I was mentioning earlier because it, our schools are based on local property taxes. And when you disenfranchise a, a people and don't give them access to economic opportunities and you devalue their homes when they are able to get one, well, then obviously their schools are not going to be equitable and have the same resources if it's based on property taxes. So the point of integration wasn't about being educated next to white students. We've seen students who are at minority serving institutions thrive, HBCUs thrive, tribal colleges thrive. It's really just access to the same, um, the same resources that uh, white students have. Yep. And, and Thank I you, think- Thank you, Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, Sorry. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. This may not be popular, but integration is probably the single worst thing that happened to the African American community from an economic standpoint, because those communities uh, had all black owned businesses. And as a, an exchange for integration, education was pushed as an opportunity for blacks to uh, exit from poverty. And what has done a phenomenal job in is creating debtors. Those businesses that were once in those communities uh, no longer exist, uh, or they're owned by other minorities or others who come into the community, they are able to make money and then they exit community without those dollars circulating, which they benefit, but the community itself doesn't. And I'm a product of integrated schools. I was fortunate enough to, um, I'm 49. And so, in uh, the early 1970s, they integrated Detroit Public Schools and they bused me into an area that provided me with um, a, a phenomenal mix of students from all ethnicities. So my experience in Detroit was much different than many of my uh, counterparts or peers because I didn't grow up in all black schools. And so my perspective of people was shaped early and I understood that, again, we were much more alike than we were different. So in Integration in that sense was phenomenal, but integration from an economic standpoint was very harmful to the black community because it's, it lost its economic base. Thank you, Derek. Um, we are just about out of time now. So I want to allow our panelists to have one closing thought or comment um, that, that you can provide to the audience or share with the audience. Um, Dr. Whitaker, you un, uh, you, you put on your video first, so I'm going to throw it to you. Well, once again, I, I'm just appreciative of the opportunity to be on the panel tonight with uh, distinguished colleagues and even those that are, are watching, uh, whether it's online or if it's on this Zoom, I know that they're doing the work too. Uh, I would just give us two things. Number one, uh, you know, we have to continue to uh, be substantive in our work, right? Uh, so looking at it from a, a broad perspective, but also going deeper, uh, the historical backdrop, but also uh, exemplar practices uh, in which we can uh, move forward. Uh, but then the other part of this is too, and I think that this, it, it's not enough discourse uh, for those of us that are doing this work is that self-care is critically important, right? Uh, we are living in a defining moment in our nation, I would argue in the world. And I think for many of us, we are just trying to just keep on gritting through without taking care of ourselves. So as much as I'm, I'm arguing the need to go deeper and to have these, uh, these real conversations, I also believe that self-care is important uh, because this problem that we're grappling with, it wasn't started overnight and it's not gonna end overnight. Uh, so therefore, if we're just trying to sprint and we went this just to be over when, you know, quite frankly, 
Uh, it, it hasn't been over in over 400 years, right? And I can even go deeper with that. Uh, we're all going to burn out. So I, I also believe that self-care is critically important. So thank you. Thank you, Ron. Derek? Yeah, um, excellent point, Dr. Whitaker. And, and I just want to add that I, I am uh, a, a student of learning and a hyper-realist. And while I believe that it's possible, it's not probable that we're going to see the change in our lifetime just simply because it's going to require uh, one group or the majority to decide that they'd be willing to give up power uh, and capital. But I do believe that phenomenal work is happening all over this country and in small cities, uh, communities, rural communities, urban centers, where great things are happening, where you can see the possibilities how do we identify what's happening in those communities and then bring that to scale? Because again, it's possible, but improbable unless there's some movement, some mechanism that in essence creates a tipping point, which forces the country to say that we must do something different to create a more inclusive uh, environment that provides equity and not necessarily equality because we're all not equal. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Angela? First of all, I want to say thank you to you and to Gwyneth Mercy and to all of the distinguished guests and to our wonderful educators um, on the call this evening. Um, I just want all of us to be inspired to bloom where we are planted, play our position, do the best we can where we are. We may not and will not, as Dr. Coleman suggested, change everything overnight or in our lifetimes, but because people persisted to get to the next day and to the next day, we can get further, faster. And so help those right in front of you, those in your classrooms and in your schools and your families and commit to justice, to truth telling, truth seeking and liberation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Goward. Um, yes, thank you for having me. Um, I love the perspectives of so many different types of educators that are on the, panel and the questions that we receive from everyone. Um, I have a couple of things. One is to seek out people, personalities, perspectives, and job titles that are not like your own. I'm particularly gravitating to Dr. Campbell tonight because she has much more of a forward hopeful, pro well, it's coming across to me as a hopeful thought process than my own. I'm, I'm, a I'm a practitioner. I'm also a realist like Dr. Coleman. So I want to talk with more and more so I can embrace a hopeful future, right? That unconditional positive regard. Um, I'm trying to seek out more people whose strengths quests are not like mine, right? Because um, I want to think about how to do this work better. The other thing is I, I am a practitioner and we need more folks who are equity minded on this side of the house. Yes, it can be challenging to do this work. It's oftentimes where you are wildly disregarded despite your expertise, um, but our students need us to help shape the policies, practices, and procedures that will govern their lives. They need us in the room to make decisions about exception requests. They need us in the room to steer budgets towards equitable curriculum, equitable extra, or we don't call it extra, co-curricular activities. Um, so I would encourage folks to think about the administrative side as well, because we need people who on that side as well who are equity minded. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists this evening, as well as our participants in the audience for a really challenging and um, inspiring and also difficult conversation. And um, I want to just let the panelists know I'm humbled by their expertise and their willingness to support us um, in this endeavor to, to do better, to be better. Um, as uh, Dr. Whitaker said, to reckon with it and acknowledge that systems reproduce the results that they were designed to. Um, and as Dr. Goward says, to demand that there is change and, and to demand action. So I thank everyone for being here tonight and I look forward to more of these conversations in the future. Uh, thank you all. I do want to let everyone know that you can visit the news and events page on the website for more information about this series. Thank you.